Kia ora koutou. Uh, thank you for that generous introduction. Thank you to Tony for his excellent paper and to Russian for agreeing to respond to what we have to say. Uh, I'd also like to thank Sam Carpenter um, for extending an invitation to come here uh, to this symposium and to Alex and Ness for their fantastic behind the scenes logistical support. Uh, it's a genuine delight to be here. This is my first visit uh, to New Zealand. Um, and I think I've made a, a, it's a great place to begin. <laughs> what I hope will be a much longer association. Um, I also want to start by thanking um, the Manoa Whenua of the land that we are on today and to acknowledge that I wrote my paper on, in Melbourne um, on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. Um, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present and note again that their sovereignty has never been ceded. So my talk today focuses on what I'm calling the era of emancipation in Britain's empire. And by that I mean the years that surrounded the transition from chattel slavery to free labour. For obvious reasons, that transition is most readily associated with Britain's colonies in the Caribbean and with the landmark passage of the 1833 Slavery Abolition Act that ultimately would lead to the emancipation of over 800,000 enslaved people. But I'm going to talk about emancipation's reverberations and also slavery's reverberations here in the Antipodes, or what the British saw as the Antipodes, and particularly in four new colonial settlements that the British government authorised between 1829 and 1840. Swan River, the Port Phillip District, South Australia, and of course, New Zealand. I'll argue that these connections were significant, that they've been obscured and under-acknowledged in Antipodean histories, and that they provide us with new insights into the histories of 19th century settler colonialism. Now, as that suggests, my talk today won't explicitly in address interactions between Christianity, Māori and colonisation, but I do hope that this discussion of those interactions' wider imperial context will be of use and of interest to you. So I'm going to start by talking briefly about what chattel slavery and its abolition involved for enslaved people and for their owners, before pausing to think about how Britons, more generally, understood this transition and their role in it. That understanding is important because it helped to give rise to a national mythology that would cast Britain as an anti-slavery nation. And that mythology, in turn, informed attitudes to settler colonialism in Australia and here as well, I think. So in the second part of the talk, I'm going to more explicitly address some of the connections between British slavery and particularly Australian, but some New Zealand settler colonialism um, that a research project I'm embarked on at the moment has, in, has identified. So slavery and emancipation. Britain's 1833 Slavery Abolition Act brought to an end chattel slavery in the Caribbean territories of the British Empire, also Mauritius and the Cape Colony. The Act laid out a series of steps towards emancipation that were to begin on the 1st of August 1834 and unfold over six years. This process was intended to mitigate the economic fallout of um, the transition from an economy dependent on enslaved labour to one dependent on waged labour. And in essence, that staggered process meant that freed slaves, now designated apprentices, would continue to work unpaid for their former owners for up to six years. The 1833 Act also provided slave owners with financial compensation for the loss of their human property. The Imperial Government um, spent £20 million on those payments, um, many billions of pounds in today's money. Before this, as a nation, Britain had been responsible for forcibly transporting around 3.5 million people from Africa to the Americas, and they're selling them into slavery. The British used enslaved labour in their Atlantic empire for several centuries before the 1830s, and notably, by the late 18th century, enslaved workers on West Indian plantations produced almost all of Britain's sugar and much of continental Europe's. When the Atlantic slave trade reached its height in the 1790s, 
Britain was the most dominant participant. Its Atlantic economy depended on enslaved labour. Yet this brutal, dehumanising and violent system was also unstable. The Haitian Revolution of the 1790s, during which enslaved people in the French colony of Saint-Domingue overthrew their colonial masters, that reverberated across the Americas. And in 1807, a combination of factors, resistance by enslaved people in Britain's own colonies, international conflicts fuelled by the French Revolution, and the efforts of Britain's own anti-slavery activists led Britain to make trading in slaves illegal. But it took a further 25 years of effort uh, before the 1833 legislation was passed that outlawed chattel slavery itself. Now, I mentioned how, with apprenticeship and the compensation that was paid to people who had owned slaves, the 1833 Slavery Abolition Act sought to ease the economic transition from slavery to free labour. I'd stress, and I think it's really important to stress, that this legislation did not and was not meant to usher in an era of workers' rights or freedoms, or at least not as we might imagine them today. Slave owners, politicians, even fervent anti-slavery activists with strong humanitarian and Christian convictions all hoped that formerly enslaved people would continue to engage in plantation labour and occupy the lowest rung on the colonial hierarchy. Abolitionists, often from afar, envisaged the formerly enslaved becoming a class of pliant and prosperous wage labourers, embracing Christianity alongside their freedom as they continued to work on those sugar plantations. Anti-slavery campaigners spoke confidently of emancipation as a great experiment, a phrase that obviously is circulating um, many parts of the empire in, in the 19th century. So they speak of emancipation as a great experiment, one that would demonstrate, that would prove that free labour was more productive than enslaved. Now, slave owners and their political allies were perhaps understandably less optimistic about this great experiment. Most of them viewed it as, at best, an enormous risk. When their efforts to prevent emancipation failed, they explored ways that they might compel freed labourers to continue working on those plantations. And indeed, where circumstances permitted, emancipated workers did choose, in great numbers, for reasons that seem very obvious to us today, to leave plantations at the end of that enforced period of apprenticeship. So planters and politicians debated how they might force those former slaves back onto the plantations, ideally for very low rates of pay. One proposal was to cultivate those Creole workers' uh, taste for luxuries, goods that could only be obtained by um, earning cash wages. White Britons frequently lamented in this era the assumed ease of subsistence living in the tropics, which allowed, they thought, peasants to disengage with the waged economy. Another possibility explored by the imperial and the colonial governments was that they should impose direct taxes on peasants' dwellings, um, though the infrastructure to collect such taxes actually barely existed. Across the post-emancipation Caribbean, new and more punitive master and servant acts were introduced, and these sought to restrict workers' options and rights. Colonial justice systems, especially at the level involving local magistrates, remained heavily biased towards employers through the 19th century. When these coercive strategies failed to push enough workers back onto the plantation economy, the imperial government would help to finance indentured immigration schemes. Ultimately, those schemes brought hundreds of thousands of migrants to parts of the Caribbean and also Mauritius, there to do, at fixed low rates of pay, the work that had once been done by enslaved people. Indentured migrants to those places came mainly from India, but also from West Africa, Madeira and China. Many of those people were in turn exploited and deceived. Through the mid-century, life in Britain's former slave colonies continued to be defined by racism, exclusion and exploitation. Emancipation's economic impact was unevenly felt, but problems intensified across the Caribbean in the later 1840s, when Britain embraced free trade. At this point, tariffs um, on foreign sugar were repealed by the British government. 
Those had protected colonial sugar growers against their foreign counterparts who still used enslaved labour, notably in Brazil and Cuba. The economies of some of Britain's colonies, most obviously Jamaica, never really recovered. Sugar estates plummeted in their value, and within 10 years, many lay abandoned. Economic distress was exacerbated by natural disasters, hurricanes and earthquakes, and outbreaks of epidemic disease. Political and racial tensions erupted between Creole workers and the planter class, most notoriously in the 1865 Morant Bay Rebellion and its violent suppression. Nearly 700 black Jamaicans lost their lives, 600 were flogged, thousands of their dwellings were destroyed. Subsequently, Jamaica's legislature reverted to a system where autocratic power was exercised by the governor. So white colonisers gave up their legislative power to avoid sharing it with their black counterparts. And that pattern was followed um, within a couple of years right across Britain's West Indian colonies. Now, as I said, contemporaries recognised emancipation as a great rupture in Britain's imperial economy. But many also hailed it as a moral statement. The 1833 Slavery Abolition Act made it possible for some people to recast Britain's empire as a beacon of morality and British imperialism as a force for civilization, Christianity and humanity. This reading of empire depended only partially on the ultimate success or failure of that great experiment because it was connected just as much to Britain's readiness, already proven by passing the Emancipation Act, its readiness to disrupt powerful vested interests and to make economic sacrifices in pursuit of emancipation. Now that framing of emancipation in turn fueled a particular reading of Britain's history. And that focused less on the profits and horrors of slavery or indeed on its grim legacies for those who had been emancipated but had previously been enslaved and much more on the British campaign to end slavery the British economic sacrifices in pursuit of that goal. So responsibility for slavery was repudiated and a claim was laid to the mantle of anti-slavery and humanitarianism. The idea that Britain was an anti-slavery nation has proved enduring and adaptable. While scholars, including Catherine Hall and Richard Hussey, have capably and incisively dissected that thesis, it still exerts a very powerful and misleading influence over public discourse nearly two centuries later. We see its influence when Britain's imperial actions are compared favourably with those of its historical and its contemporary counterparts. From the 19th century through to the 21st, it's been used by some to disavow responsibility, not only for slavery, but also for later imperial policies. Those misconceptions about Britain's past have also influenced, I think, the histories of Australia and also probably New Zealand. A couple of years ago, to test this out, uh, my colleague Georgina Arnott and I systematically searched Australia's and New Zealand's dictionaries of national biography for references to the word, words connected with slavery. We chose biographical dictionaries because they combine authoritative academic scholarship with a claim to speak to and for the national public. We had important independent evidence of connections to slavery for a subset of individuals with um, entries in those biographical dictionaries, but we found that in both the Australian and the New Zealand case, and the British case for that matter, the dictionaries were much more likely to record even very fleeting engagement with anti-slavery activism than significant profit from or support for chattel slavery. Now, hagiography isn't surprising in projects that are so closely associated with the national psyche, but it's important to think about how such tendencies shape both national conversations and history writing. So what spaces for other historical narratives or other myths did ignoring those connections with the brutality of Atlantic chattel slavery, what, did, what, did, what was opened up by those omissions? And it's only recently, really, that historians of Australia and New Zealand have begun to excavate connections between settler colonialism and British slavery. But that research suggests that those connections are important and illuminating, as well as diverse. Most obviously, we've found that emancipation prompted significant numbers of individuals and investors to divest from the Atlantic slave economy and to move to or to invest in the Antipodean colonies. When we study this, we're interested both in the capital and the mindsets that they brought with them.
Other connections arise from that sense I spoke of before, that emancipation meant the moral reorientation of empire, a rupture with a shameful past. Activists for Indigenous rights and opponents of convict transportation both envisaged Britain, the anti-slavery nation, becoming a vector for a more civilising and civilised form of colonialism. Britain would champion new freedoms for the impressed imperial subjects. Before I finish by outlining the links between profit from slavery and settler colonialism, I want to just expand on that a little bit, thinking about the connections that some Britons drew between emancipation and Indigenous rights in Australasia. And the focus I'll adopt here is on a London-based organisation, the Aborigines Protection Society, or the APS, uh, on which I've, I've written extensively. So the APS was established in 1837, right in the heart of the era of emancipation. Prominent anti-slavery activists were among its founders, including the parliamentary champion of that 1833 um, Slavery Abolition Act, the MP Thomas Fowle Buxton. Buxton and his fellow advocates of Indigenous protection hoped that British abolitionists, flushed with their recent success, would refocus their philanthropic efforts on protecting Indigenous peoples from British settler colonisers. Recent events in Southern Africa, in Australia, in Canada, and intensifying pressure to colonise these islands were at the forefront of their minds. With ideas and in language that we recognise today as Eurocentric and paternalistic, the APS embarked confidently on political lobbying and generating public pressure. At the point of its foundation, the APS had concluded that it was actually impossible to end British settler colonialism altogether. So instead, it sought to articulate a new beneficial form of settler colonialism. This was going to be administered by a cadre that combined upstanding British officials with indigenous Christian converts. The civilization that it would deliver, in their view, would elevate not only indigenous peoples, but also settler colonizers, who the APS framed as brutal and out of control. Now, as that suggests, the central figures in the London-based society thought themselves capable of determining what indigenous peoples in the empire wanted and needed. Initially, the APS was optimistic. In the 1830s, the promoters of South Australia and then New Zealand felt compelled to take account of indigenous peoples in their plans and the Imperial Government announced that protectors of Aborigines would be appointed in the Antipodean colonies. Now, as we know, that new dawn, if it was such, was short-lived and largely rhetorical. As an early APS activist warned, we at home and at the Aborigines in the colony may be played with, with the sound of protectors and protection. Settler colonialism, of course, intensified. Through the mid-century, settler colonisers gained more political autonomy, over their um, own affairs. And simultaneously, across much, much of the empire, indigenous people faced more, not fewer, barriers to the recognition or exercise of their rights. The leaders of the APS, and especially its central figure through these decades, a man called Dr Thomas Hodgkin, became disillusioned. From the 1870s, the society's focus shifted away from settler colonies towards Africa and the Pacific Islands. Hodgkin's distress stemmed not solely from imperial policy and colonial action, but also the cynical way in which those were justified. Hodgkin was witnessing what historians Alan Lester and Faye Desart have identified as the implementation of humanitarian governance, drawing not least on the rhetoric of anti-slavery and civilization, a rhetoric the APS had contributed to. The imperial government presented settler colonialism as a vector of progress rather than destruction, even when that was very far from the case. The APS's idealistic, if chauvinistic, vision for that universally beneficial settler colonialism was deployed very cynically. And despite their roots in anti-slavery, Hodgkin also came to see the APS as in competition with anti-slavery activists, who by that stage, the 1850s, were focusing especially on the United States. He feared that public attention, philanthropic donations and political interest, perhaps even moral and religious sentiment, were finite. Their distribution was decided by a grotesque calculus that revolved around what was perceived as causing more harm to more people. Settler colonialism, slavery or heathenism. So these are the kinds of interactions that define mid-century imperial humanitarianism. They give us an insight into how emancipation and the idea of an anti-slavery nation 
was invoked to justify Britain's self-interested actions in the colonies of settlement. But I'm going to turn in the last part of this talk from those who opposed or sought to mitigate the consequences of British settler colonialism to those who drove it. Now, this is research funded by the Australian Research Council and involving collaboration across Australia and with colleagues in the UK. Our work's focused on identifying individuals engaged in the business of slavery who refocused then on Antipodean settler colonialism. I choose that phrase, the business of slavery, quite deliberately because it includes all of those whose lives and fortunes were bound up in this slavery-driven economy. The digitised records of the compensation that was paid to slave owners at emancipation have been invaluable for this research. Our work would never have begun without the immense labours of our partners in the Legacies of British Slave Ownership Project at UCL in the UK, notably Catherine Hall, Nick Draper and Keith McClellan. But our interest extends beyond slave ownership at abolition. Earlier and later generations also link slavery and um, Australian settler colonialism. We've traced plantation owners and overseers, formerly enslaved people, transatlantic traders, and British merchant capitalists, absentee investors in Britain who profited from slavery even if they never encountered an enslaved person, and those whose careers, whether civil, judicial, naval, military or religious, drew them into the defence and governance of the slave system. Existing scholarship, um, Emma Christopher's research is particularly notable, has shown how Queensland's sugar industry derived from its Caribbean counterpart. West Indian estate owners transferred their capital, their expertise, in some cases even their formerly enslaved workforce, from their Caribbean sugar plantations to Australia. And these same families would become prominent in recruiting Pacific labour for their Queensland plantations sometimes coerced, uh, more frequently perhaps very poorly treated. By contrast, the project that I'm engaged in has focused on the emancipation era foundation of colonies in Australasia's temperate zones, places where neither the plantation model nor its tropical fruits could transfer quite so directly. There, early, set, early settler colonisers developed pastoral economies on indigenous land, whether stolen or brought cheaply, they reared fine sheep for wool and they raised fat cattle. Each colony experienced a mineral boom and those boosted their populations and economies in distinctive ways. Everywhere, those settler colonisers sought cheap land as well as sufficient labour to make it profitable. Capital generated in the business of slavery, including compensation for freed slaves, helped establish each of those new British outposts. Slavery's legacies also continued to reverberate in them over the coming decades. So despite their divergent, if sometimes overlapping, origins, we've identified some really important links between them and the business of slavery. The impetus for the settlement at Swan River, for example, at the heart of what would become Western Australia, came from interests tied closely both to the Atlantic economy and to the fortunes of the East India Company. My colleagues Georgina Arnott and Aoife Nugent have explored how firmly James Stirling, both the promoter and the first governor of Western Australia, was connected to the business of slavery. Founded in 1829, the Swan River Colony, of course, preceded the Slavery Abolition Act. And Jane Lydon and Jeremy Martins have shown how members of the Caribbean planter class were nevertheless prominent among Western Australia's earliest settlers. For example, the interconnected Ridley and Walcott families sold their slaves and their plantations in British Guyana by the mid-1820s before they migrated to Swan River in 1829. And there, on Noongar country, they investigated the viability and profitability of tropical crops, timbers and sugar before turning to pastoralism in the Avon Valley. Like a number of other early Swan River settlers, they brought expectations from the Caribbean about how to recruit, to manage and to exploit non-white labour. They were also prominent participants in violent and punitive actions against the Aboriginal peoples of Western Australia. On the other side of the continent, in the Port Phillip district, the ad hoc arrival of settler colonisers from 1834 on preceded formal colonisation. Two years after that, 1836, unable to control colonisers' expansion, the Imperial Government declared the region a district of New South Wales. Now, histories of Victoria's settler colonial origins have often focused on the private treaty 
that John Batman negotiated with the Wurundjeri people of what is today Melbourne. But the rapacious pastoralism that underpinned the colony began to Melbourne's west, stretching 300 kilometres from what is today the city of Geelong to Portland Bay, so south of that bright red line. And there, settler colonisers brought sheep, cattle and horses across Bass Strait from 1834. They also engaged in brutal, devastating conflict with the region's indigenous peoples, the Wurundjeri, Wadawurrung, Jaburung, Gunditjmara, Jagadwurrung and others. Within 15 years, the indigenous population of Victoria had fallen by about 80%. Those who survived faced continuing waves of dispossession, exploitation and family separation, whilst also becoming enmeshed in the colonial economy. Historians have analysed Victoria's settler colonial pastoralists, the squatters, by reference to the ethnic and sectarian differences that they brought with them from the British Isles, Scots, Irish, English, Presbyterians, Catholics, Anglicans. The churches and the chapels that they erected still punctuate the landscape, like the volcanic outcrops they sit alongside. Those early pastoralists hid much of their violence against Indigenous peoples, and it's taken a very long time for most histories to address it. Instead, those colonisers have been celebrated as overcoming the land and its elements, and as essentially self-made. But many, and especially those who are most prosperous, relied on capital that had been made in the Atlantic economy. So one of the largest early pastoral businesses was called the Clyde Company. Established to the west of Geelong in the middle of 1836, its value increased 30-fold over 20 years. Its property stretched over 230,000 acres. Throughout, it was managed by a man called George Russell, who'd migrated by way of Van Diemen's Land. Russell was indeed a Scottish Presbyterian of modest means and a capacity for hard work. But it was the capital behind the Clyde Company that connects this pastoral business to the business of slavery. Five of the Clyde Company's original seven partners were Scottish merchant traders with a heavy Atlantic investments, strongly representative of what Stephen Mullen has called the Glasgow sugar aristocracy. And all, in some way or another, were connected to a prominent trading house in Glasgow, J&A Deniston. In 1836, the Clyde Company's partners and their debtors had just received compensation for enslaved people. A Scottish connection to the Denistons, who'd already established himself in Van Diemen's Land with their help, alerted them to the opportunities newly opening up around Port Phillip Bay, and the Clyde Company partners invested accordingly. Others among the most important Victorian pastoral ventures were similarly backed by capital raised through the ownership or labour of slaves. When a profound financial crisis hit the early Port Phillip district in the early 1840s, pastoral companies with offshore investors like this were more likely to survive than those who'd been financed locally. In 1841, for example, the Clyde Company's partners agreed to invest another uh, more than six and a half thousand pounds. And that allowed the manager, George Russell, to expand his operations at the expense of his more cash-strapped neighbours. Over time, the senior partners in J&A Deniston became majority shareholders in the Clyde Company. The Glasgow merchants also established two firms in Melbourne to handle the affairs of the Clyde Company and other um, Western District pastoralists. To manage those subsidiary businesses, the Denistons dispatched employees, relatives and in-laws. Some became pastoralists and politicians on their own account. One, James McCulloch, was also Victoria's longest serving 19th century premier. And other mercantile firms with an Atlantic focus opened branches in the Australian colonies and indeed here in New Zealand. I'm going to skip pretty swiftly past South Australia, um, which is founded, of course, with um, the backing of systematic colonisers on a plan, a version of Edward Gibbon Wakefield's plan. But we have found very significant links um, to capital raised through slavery amongst the colonisation commissioners who were in charge of land sales there and amongst its early settlers as well. Colleagues here in New Zealand, um, notably Angela Wanhalla and Angela MacArthur, are focusing on the legacies of British slavery on this side of the Tasman. We've also identified important and diverse connections, few of which have received um, historical attention in this context, I think. And this slide includes just a few names of people who arrived in or before 1840. Note that they include a man who was born enslaved in Jamaica, uh, but, but migrated to New Zealand. Uh, that they include notable pastoralists, the Stokes brothers. And to remind us that colonisation never goes in just one direction, 
Samuel Martin, who arrived early here, but then re-migrated uh, to British Guyana in 1844. So that brief sketch of links between slavery and early immigrants um, to these four settler colonies underscores the variety of connections that we've identified. And our list of leads continues to grow. But it wasn't just those who came in the first wave of colonizers, nor solely those who intended to stay or to settle who were linked to the business of slavery. So at the moment, I've been engaged in a cohort study of all the pre-Federation, so that's pre-1901 governors of um, Australia's colonies. And surprisingly to me, and I'm involved in this, we found that of those 69 individuals, 16 or 17, so 25% nearly, had strong personal connections to the business of slavery. I'm going to discuss one very briefly here in conclusion. That's Henry Barclay, Governor of Victoria from 1857 to 63. Barclay and his father were two partners uh, in a London-based firm that received uh, the enormous sum of £165,000 of compensation for their enslaved Caribbean workforce. It was a firm that traded enslaved produced goods, provided finance to the West Indian economy, and owned plantations and enslaved people. Its turnover was immense, but the firm was also overexposed in 1834. So when apprenticeship ended, Henry Barclay spent long periods in the West Indies trying to secure a new labour force and to make his estates profitable. He became a British Member of Parliament. He was very outspoken about abolition's consequences. He told the Commons in 1846 that if the great experiment of emancipation had succeeded morally, it had failed economically. But Barclay's critique went beyond economics. Emancipation had destabilised his worldview and in his oft reiterated opinion, slaves had not simply been freed, their new capacity to withhold their labour from plantation owners, rather than simply to be paid for their labour, had actually made slaves into masters and masters, he thought, into slaves. In 1849, he became the governor of British Guyana, where he was still one of the largest plantation owners. That was followed by four years as governor of Jamaica, where he had previously owned estates. From there, he transferred to Victoria. In both his Caribbean postings, Barclay's remembered for balancing the books, for making legislatures more effective and representative. He also obsessively sought to secure and to deploy labour, especially indentured immigrant labour for the plantation economy. Now, by the time Barclay reached Melbourne in 1857, the two contexts, Caribbean and Antipodean, looked pretty different. However, apart from the old West India contacts that Barclay re-encountered in Victoria, fellow planters, civil servants, senior members of the judiciary. He also transferred understandings of empire and its subject peoples, honed during his Caribbean administrations. And those affected um, the attitudes that he would display to indentured labour, squatting, access to land, Victoria's immigrant Chinese population, and of course, its indigenous people. So, in the Australian case, as I said, almost a quarter of the pre-Federation governors fall into that category of a strong personal or family benefit from the business of slavery. Even more startling to me, however, has been what happens if we think about governors like Barclay, who had a significant professional experience in colonies where slavery was legal or had recently been abolished. If we take that as our criteria, 40 of those 69 pre-1901 governors had that kind of connection. And in total, thinking of the two categories together, two thirds of Australia's governors before 1901 were linked significantly to the business of slavery. And that's a pattern that I think extends to New Zealand as well. Our catalogue of these connections is growing. How should we gauge its significance? It's worth stressing that each link is distinctive and requires individual attention. Some of them dictated lives, some informed mentalities, others had a much more diffuse impact. But those connections are revealing collectively. For some echelons of society, links to the business of slavery are particularly pervasive. As the society of, uh, the, sorry, that study of governors showed, they included the most powerful in settler society. The southern Australian colonies' um, early pastoral economies were strongly boosted by their connections to the Caribbean and to slavery. Australian pastoralists with connections to slavery also featured prominently as supporters of schemes to coerce non-white labourers, indigenous and immigrant, into low-paid waged work. The number, the diversity, the significance of those links, their very pervasiveness, gives us insights into British assumptions about their right to the empire's resources and indeed to its purpose. 
Whether Britain's rude or celebrated the 1833 abolition of slavery, those assumptions shaped how subsequent imperial policy was conceived and justified, including here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Thank you. In Arangatira Namihinui Kia Koto, uh, Pihopa Tena Kwe, in a um, in a minita, mina um, Ahorangi, mina Kayako, mina Homa, he Namihinui Kia Tato Katoa, um, Etone, uh, Mezoe, uh, Namihinui Kia Koro, uh, Motofakaro. Um, in deference to time, and also because I'm not known for my own uh, lack of words per minute, um, I, will, I won't do a full amihi, but it is appropriate to begin by just honouring to the two of you. Um, Tony and Zoe have, in my own story, uh, my own journey as, as in scholarship, been very significant, and they have carried a kind of framing that is very significant to Aotearoa's story. So in uh, 2010, when I was finished off my, uh, my honours, uh, my foray into postgraduate study, um, I encountered Tony's essay on the historiogra historiography of the British Empire. And the richness with which he drew together stories and scholarship from all over the globe, from India, from Africa, from, um, from, from the metropolitan certainly, but also the depth of humanness that was captured in that, which he has continued then in his books, uh, Web of Empire and Entanglements of Empire. Um, and with Zoe, um, I actually don't recall when we first met. I think it might have been the transnational seminar at Oxford. We had a budget. I'd known Zoe's... Uh, uh, Colonial Connections book, which again so deeply traced these uh, human stories through these complex systems, um, and have been privileged to, 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 to engage with you over a number of years. Um, and Zoe's work uh, in uh, protecting the empire's humanity, tracing through the life and lens of Thomas Hodgkin, that work and that complex uh, and very mixed story of the Aborigines Protection Society, uh, shows very much how the, the humanness of these stories can come through within bigger macro trends. And we've seen that uh, this, the, today, uh, that sense that Aotearoa's stories uh, need framing, but they need attentiveness to the frames. Um, we can see the depth of the humanness within that while also paying attention to the macro trends. And so just very briefly to respond to a few of the themes that you've raised and, and stitch them together into the wider corridor of this conference. Um, both of our papers today have paid attention to the sensitivities of the networks and the ideational culture of contemporary agents while also looking to macro trends. Um, I think, and, and as Zoe has rightly pointed out, there are significant elements of New Zealand's history that occur outside of our national frame. Emancipation is a seismic event. Reverberations is a very um, subtle word for what is dramatic in the global economic space that leads to these significant overflows. And, we can trace a long arc of engagement between anti-slavery networks and humanitarian networks and missions from as early as the 1770s, uh, and certainly in the 1780s and 90s, affecting the imagination of, of Aotearoa from entities like the Sierra Leone Company, um, and as you pointed out, the shifts in banking networks and structures. Uh, in the 1780s, anti-slavery movements in Britain, uh, they are, are, are driven uh, in their innovation and their financial networking by the country banking revolution. 80% uh, of those banks, 80% of the market of the country banking revolution is dominated by eight banks, seven of which are run by evangelical partners and one of which is Barclays, which is a Quaker bank. And that sets up a wave of financial innovation that drives these humanitarian and philanthropic movements. And one part of the thread, if I can speculate, is that by the 1830s, when you get these significant capital flows caused by emancipation, that that changes the dynamic and pivots it back towards the more uh, historical deposit banks and some of the merc mercantile investment banks. And these flows have significance for Aotearoa's story. There is also a long... Uh, story that we need to tell about the interrelationship between the humanitarian narratives and the way that these are co-opted by different threads of this conversation that in many ways arise or at least echo from Aotearoa and from Australasia. So Wakefield's letter from Sydney famously begins to repurpose humanitarian moral frames for calls for settler colonisation. Um, and this becomes a very complicated series of conversations. Um, in Aotearoa, of course, uh, emancipation is also tied intrinsically in the work of missionaries to the work of peacemaking. 
uh, in places like West Africa, the, the, uh, the unforgivable trade, if you were involved in philanthropy or humanitarianism or missions work, was of course to participate in slave trading. Here it's muskets because of the interrelationship between muskets and arming and the two-way interrelationship uh, and uh, the movement of bodies and freedoms. Um, and so for evangelical missionaries, for philanthropists, for humanitarians, these reforming narratives, I think, Tony, you called them, um, you, you referred, referred to them in terms of um, the idea of, um, uh, excuse me, cultural, yeah, cultural irritants. They would prefer the word reformer, I think, but their contemporaries certainly saw them as irritants. Um, these reforming narratives uh, were seen as enhancing the effective, uh, enhanced by the effectiveness of initiatives among Māori, but also complicating these relationships. And so in Aotearoa, there was no single great emancipation, but rather a series of two-way dialogues. And of course, this feeds into the bigger articulation of what Aotearoa's identity is. Aotearoa has often seen itself, particularly in the 19th century, as a better Britain, in which freedom was assumed. We might think of the famous cartoons at this, in the conversations around federation, showing the, the, the slaves of chaining um, to Australia, unfortunately. Um, but that sense that this is much more complicated for us. And Tony, uh, your work uh, pointing out the way in which the empire was not monolithic, but a series of orientations and interactions in which uh, religious uh, tendencies um, and so forth come forward. I think it's really significant that you pointed us to the relationship between Marsden and Campbell and the relationship between uh, commercial networks in this period and settlement, and also highlighted the relationships around Tukufinua um, and the way that missions became by this period deeply embedded. Um, the language of attachment, of affection, and so forth, which in King's words is very, very human and very framed in terms of his own sense of feeling uh, and his own, his own whānau and relationships, but which as we know, and as you point out in other work, uh, is echoed back in England by the likes of Fitzroy and Coates, who are layering onto languages of sovereign debate, of imperial encroachment, uh, trying to layer that with British law concepts like right of common, um, talking about languages of trust, and so forth. And so, to finish, I think, your use of the burial grounds is very, very significant, um, and talks to what Tajo Williams was pointing to yesterday, that, that sense of the mutuality of change that occurs in these things. I was struck in, in engaging with your paper at the echo of uh, Maui's story. Um, many of you know the story of Maui and, and Tony's written on it. Um, a young Maori man who uh, makes his way to London via Norfolk Island, uh, dies there tragically in 1816 of a wave of disease that also kills a number of uh, children of key evangelical uh, families. And Maui is uh, ministered to in his last months, in his last weeks, particularly by Basil Wood, a member of the secretary, uh, a member of the uh, CMS uh, committee. Um, and Wood uh, conducts Maori's, Maui's funeral sermon. He buries him. And because the young man had only been in Britain for a few months, he hadn't, uh, he had, had no rights to parish burial and so forth. So Wood buries him in Bentick Chapel, a private chapel that he had the right to, and covers the costs. And he uses in the funeral sermon uh, the passage from Acts 10, uh, Acts 10, 34 and 35. Um, the, phrase, the quotation from Peter, having been shown the vision where God invites him to eat, and then having experienced the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on Cornelius' family. And Peter speaks, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what, right, what is right. And we know from, Bud, uh, from Wood's correspondence at the time that there was a duality to that favoritism. He was in despair that this young man who, who he had had so much hope for had died uh, so, uh, so early. He was also mourning the death of his own brother several months before, uh, also called Thomas, uh, had died in his late 30s. And Wood saw a strange uh, disappointment in Providence in, this, in the moment. Um, and in his own reflections, seems to have applied a kind of almost brotherly care to the, to the burial of Maui. And again, we, uh, firsts have a strange place but, uh, and a complex place, um, but Maui may be the first Maori uh, 
who was buried in a Church of England uh, cemetery in London. So for us who are seeking to engage with how do we tell the stories of New Zealand as a historical nation, the challenge for us is framing. Uh, many of our stories do not happen here, but they are reciprocal. The frames don't lead us to easy binaries. Uh, they complicate themselves, and the frame of our stories is human, the human, not the individual, um, but certainly humans within these stories. And so I want to just thank you both for the way that you've drawn that out, the way that you have pointed our attention to both bigger themes, but also the embedded narratives here, uh, so locally in Aotearoa. So, nami hiniwiki o koroa, tēnā koutou.